Hi there. Thank you for downloading and listening to the 4 Million Years Later podcast. This is a show where two old friends get together and rewatch an episode of the Gentleman Transformer series in order and then sit down and talk about what they saw. We grew up with the show. We were children when the show first aired. We are adults now going back to reflect on the series, how we thought about it as a child and how we think about it as adults today. My name is Jersey Drost. I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist and the other host is... I am the ultimate hoove for the last time. The ultimate hoove part three. One last hoove. <laughs> One last ultimate hoove. No more hooves after this. No more... <laughs> It sounds like a Slurpee size. <laughs> <laughs> As it should. So, <laughs> no, no, I don't want a double gulp. I want an ultimate hoove. You can't even fit that in your car. Why are you even doing that? All right. <laughs> Episode 13, The Ultimate Doom Part 3, written by Doug Booth and Leo D. Power? P A U R? <laughs> So we're closing out the second miniseries in Transformers, and after this one, we're three episodes away from the end of the first season. Is that right? Yep, 16 total. Wow. So, gosh, we're almost done with season one. Then we got to dive into the weirdness that is season two. So what's the logline for this episode? Wheeljack creates a gadget with the ability to cancel out hypnotic chips. With Sparkplug back... And with all other humans free, the Autobots' next problem is getting Cybertron back into space. I'm guessing that by that description they mean like into deep space. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's not on Earth, right? <laughs> I hope not. It's just sitting in Washington. It's just like <laughs> sitting on the ground. <laughs> Primus is just awkwardly looking left and right as everybody's walking around him really annoyed. He's <laughs> holding up traffic. <laughs> So Leo D. Power is not a name I recognize. You and most of the rest of humanity, this is apparently his first and only Transformers writing credit. And according to IMDb, he doesn't get another writing credit until 1992. So writing doesn't seem to have been his thing. I don't know if he was just a friend of a regular writer and he was just like, hey, let me try my hand at this thing. Okay, uh, I don't know. Very mysterious. Mm. But uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Leo, if, you, if you're listening, uh, reach out to us <laughs> four million years later at gmail.com. Oh, We'd sure love to know your is. story. <laughs> Every writer and artist mm -hmm. in the series is listening. Like, even Nelson Shin is listening, and they're just like waiting. Like, what did they think? I hope they liked it. <laughs> <laughs> They've been subscribed since day one. <laughs> you laugh, and we're going to find out something weird like that later on. So, quick note on this mini series from my perspective growing up with it. As I said in many past episodes, including episode zero, which is the primer for the series, if you are new to the show, we recommend you go listen to episode zero to hear like what the thesis of this series is. I recorded almost every episode of the original G1 series on videotape when I was a kid. There were certain episodes that were missing out of my recordings, and there were some that I didn't bother recording because I had them on FHE video cassettes. <laughs> Have we explained what FHE video cassettes were on this, year, this show? Uh, no, I think we just kind of mentioned them. That was the brand of videos that uh, had the Transformers and G.I. Joe license. It stood for Family Home Entertainment, and they had like a little intro before all the shows. <laughs> it was so long. I mean, it's actually, it's only like about like six seconds, but I remember as a kid when I would pop those tapes, I'm like, just get on with it! Put the show on! <laughs> I did because like the kid just go like F A G, you know. Thanks mm -hmm. for thanks for purchasing an F A G tape. It's like this yellow thing pops up, and then this the the F A G logo is slowly drawn on like that guide paper that we used when we were in like first and second grade, right? <laughs> yeah, it looks like someone writing it in crayon. <laughs> and then it just goes Pew, and flies away, and then the show starts. Mm -hmm. So I had Ultimate Doom on FHE video cassette, and they, it was the whole miniseries just smushed together. There was mm. no intro outro between episodes, and because of that, I didn't have the Victor Caroli sort of ah. recap of what's been happening. And so when I went back to rewatch this, it felt very fresh to me. Like, oh my goodness, it almost like found footage for me. <laughs> like, that's right. He used to explain what's happening between episodes. He tells you at the end of the episode what to expect next time and what previously happened. And this opening that where he's like telling us what's happened in parts one and two of Ultimate Doom, 
he makes it sound so scary. And then it ends with him going, the Transformers, the ultimate doom. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> A theme I keep repeating on this podcast is uh, the Gen 1 Transformers cartoon was very serious, like much more serious than I remember. And like that opening recap just makes it seem that much more like it just feels very dire as he starts this episode. (laughs) Well, I mean, it's not called the ultimate party. It's called the ultimate (laughs) doom. The ultimate bar mitzvah. (laughs) The the ultimate vacation. Well, it's supposed to be sort of an ecological apocalypse, for lack of a better phrase. So, I mean, this is kind of, especially (laughs) so far in the series, the ultimate doom. I mean, we haven't seen things this dire. The ultimate Christmas. The (laughs) ultimate shopping spree. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the ultimate first day of school. <laughs> yeah, like it, it, you put that in front of anything else, it, it doesn't have quite the impact as the ultimate doom. <laughs> and it is. Yes, Megatron is ripping the Earth to pieces to collect the energy. Starscream's about to one-up him in the next episode, but this is pretty bad. So he frightens us with his scary voice, <laughs> and then where does the episode start? <laughs> well, we open on Cybertron where a brainwashed spark plug wiki has just sounded the alarm in Decepticon headquarters on Cybertron. And having caught Spike, Braun, and Bumblebee gathering intel right there in their headquarters. Mm -hmm. So Spike sheds tears as his father asks for forgiveness in his robotic mind-controlled voice. Yeah, weird line, right? Because, like, before that... He's like, an invader, the Decepticons must be warned, must sound alarm. And then like when Spike's standing there crying, like, Dad, how could you? He just says, forgive me. <laughs> what? Why? Because I thought like brainwashed spark plug is like angry spark plug, right? Don't call me that. The Decepticons will triumph. Forgive me. Okay, I guess. It's well, kind of a weird line. he's combating the mind control and maybe since it's lasted a while now, he's he's getting better at combating it and he can get out some sentences sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why Dr. Archival had to put the new chip on him in the last episode. Yeah, he keeps burning yeah. out through them or something. All the love for his son and his favorite wrench, like yep. just override the chip eventually. <laughs> it's all okay. about that wrench. <laughs> so Whenever Spike's in front of him crying, he just sees a giant wrench. <laughs> like the gold rush with charlie chaplin yeah it just it's always a wrench okay so they they're gonna try to get out of here let's uh we gotta get out of here and bumblebee it says that as he turns he's looking over his shoulder as he's running away and his (laughs) sentence is cut short he literally runs into shockwave literally he just runs into his leg and bounces off and this is where shockwave begins a series of poster-like proclamations to explain what he's about to do. He keeps doing this in this scene. What does he say when he sees Bumblebee? Destruction to all trespassers. (laughs) And then, yeah, like, uh, Braun turns around and he sees that he's surrounded. He's trying to be funny in the situation. He's like, don't suppose I can interest any of you in a magazine subscription? (laughs) And then Soundwave, who's flanked by what? There's some funny coloring going on in these jets in this next couple scenes. Yeah. The Seeker colors, like, change color every time the perspective of the shot changes. So it's like... yeah. Really, animators, you didn't realize that these are supposed to be the same guys when you (laughs) move the camera like six feet. (laughs) Their paint is like laser blazer paint. (laughs) 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 Initially, the two seekers who come in with Soundwave, one has sort of a dark navy blue, darker than Thundercracker usually, and the other one is light purple. So how does Hoover feel about this? How does Hoover feel when he sees these two jets? I'm always glad to see generic Seekers. I just like the fact that, you know, this is an army and this is what the troopers look like. I always sort of wonder if the colors mean anything. Like, do the colors denote some sort of ranking or is it just truly random? There are always (laughs) multiple colors of Seekers. So I just always Mm -hmm. wonder if it was... I'm sure no one really put any thought into this whatsoever. They're just like, different guys, different colors. Yeah, but again, we keep coming on this idea that Sunbow animated shows do this thing where they suggest just enough to get you to wonder and imagine. 
and I like the idea of like, oh, you want to be, you want to join the Seeker Armada? Well, you know, here's your color swatches. Right. Figure out your look. You know, like they're playing Armored Core. You know, customize your look. <laughs> yeah. And this navy blue jet actually looks, that's a cool color mm-hmm. scheme on that guy. Coincidentally, it's it's really more of the toy colors for Thundercracker. But the mm. animation model is much lighter blue than the original toy. Yeah. So Soundwave says, take them. And Braun's <laughs> like, I don't take so easy. Oh, I love Braun in this episode. Yeah, this he is, is a really so great good. Spotlight for Braun. Yeah. And so what happens? Well, <laughs> Braun makes short work of the two seekers who are considerably bigger than him, but he still just knocks them over very easily. He like comes up to their knees. Yeah. He sort of like just grabs them by the lower legs, just like throws them to each side. <laughs> <laughs> like, You're out of the picture, guys. <laughs> I have like a sort of a 10,000 foot up note about this whole episode that I'm going to keep. This is one of those exemplary scenes and there's like other ones I'm going to point out as we go. This three-parter, all, most of season one, suffers a little bit from like some low frame rate stuff. Like stuff that mm-hmm. isn't as smooth as they were trying to make it. Like I think you pointed out in, oh gosh, I forget which episode it was, but there was a fight scene where it's like it's promising a lot of really interesting stuff. I think it was the fight in Fire in the Sky with Megatron and Prime when they're fighting with the green crystals mm. where it's suggesting like a lot of really cool fluid action and it gets close, but it doesn't quite like look as fluid as it does in your memory when you think about it later. Right. But I think this is my, I'm going to propose this and we can come back to this idea when we get to the episode um, city of steel. I think that low frame rate can be saved by really, really great staging, blocking, and composition, which I think this episode has a lot of good stuff in that direction. It has some really beautifully arranged and composed scenes so that when the movement isn't quite as smooth as you expect, it doesn't matter. And this is one of those scenes where it's like the movement, when Braun tosses those two jets aside, it's not super smooth. But it looks great because of the angle that they shot it from. And then, like, plus everybody's, like, really, really on model. So it just looks really well drawn and well organized as far as, like, visual information. Mm. So I think that this entire episode stands out in that way. There aren't any, like, really big weak spots in my opinion. But at the same time, like, there's lots of shots where it's like, eh, it, the movement was a little bit clunky. But it doesn't matter because it's drawn so well. Yeah. So Braun makes short work of those two guys, and then on top of that, he shoots Soundwave, and Soundwave goes careening into a wall. (laughs) Okay, this is another thing I love. Soundwave, we've established, creepiest of all the Decepticons. Weird guy, talks weird, doesn't really express a lot of emotions, has a family who lives at his torso, loves Megatron a lot, (laughs) turns into a lamppost. Weird! (laughs) At every level, weird guy. So, and he's like one of those characters that like most bros, like, regardless of your gender like I, i'm saying bro like in terms of like the mindset like like dude it's so cool i wish like megatron murdered somebody on screen kind of people who love the show <laughs> like they love soundwave right understandably so i like him he's cool but that makes the way broad disposes of soundwave so much more satisfying for me because like he shoots him and soundwave just like hits the wall and slides down the wall <laughs> like a warner brothers cartoon character it's like Yeah, that's right. That for you, big, weird, creepy guy. Braun is like up to your knee, but he took you down. That's how scary you are, Mr. Nine Inch Nails Vampire Decepticon. (laughs) (laughs) Please note how dated Jersey's references are. (laughs) Okay, insane cloud posse Decepticon. (laughs) (laughs) Again, please note how dated Jersey's references are. Oh, I couldn't even name a single one of their songs either. Okay, so yeah, Braun takes out Soundwave, goes into the wall. Spike tries to flee, but Shockwave orders Sparkplug to stop him. Sparkplug <laughs> blocks Spike's exit as he pleads with his father. And Shockwave shoots at the distracted Spike, but Braun leaps in the way, taking the blast and crashing into the wall, which brings a support beam down from the ceiling. This mm-hmm. is pretty intense. Shockwave is trying to literally murder Spike. (laughs) Spike and Sparkplug. There's no question that that shot would have taken out both of them, right? And it's only Braun that saved him. And Braun takes it the shoulder, but it just like falls down. He's like, ooh, you know, and then he gets right back up. And he's like, prepare for a large headache as he picks up that support beam and then starts bum rushing Shockwave. (laughs) He is so cool for such a cheap toy. Oh, I know. That toy is not great. No. (laughs) It's not only is it a cheap toy, but it's a pretty darn ugly toy 
<laughs> and unfortunately, well, I guess fortunately they made him look a lot better on the show. But uh, man, he always deserved a better toy. And thankfully, due to the third party companies making their own Transformers these days, you can get a nice looking brawn that actually looks like the show. You know, rewatching this episode actually made me want to go get that figure. Mm-hmm. So that's a, that's another one. TF Source, you should be advertising on this show, too. We're going to start talking about these guys in a way that gets people like, I kind of want a masterpiece edition of that. Mm-hmm. Anyway. So, yeah, uh, Braun is, like, rushing at Shockwave. Shockwave, who is, like, even taller than Soundwave. This big, bad dude. He turns into a giant space gun. Braun, what are you going to do about that? Well, I'm going to take the support beam. I'm going to run at that guy. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll see what happens. <laughs> well, Shockwave sets his phaser arm to annihilate, <laughs> and he atomizes the beam in Braun's hand. It just sort of, like, melts and disappears. <laughs> yeah. And then the Seekers that Braun knocked over and Soundwave have gotten up, and they move into attack as well. But suddenly a hole is blown through the wall and Skyfire, Wheeljack, and Trailbreaker enter. <laughs> now, hold on, because if this happens a couple times in the episode, I want to make sure everybody notices this. Shaku says, take the boy and destroy them. And then you see the two Seekers walking toward Braun and Bumblebee, and then the wall next to them explodes, <laughs> and the Seekers are gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Seekers are total cannon fodder in this episode. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And then, yeah, who who made the hole? It's Skyfire. <laughs> they come in and then like, lasers everywhere. Mm-hmm. Yet, even though they're like 12 feet away from each other and all shooting like crazy, like, yeah. Spike can st- still talk to Wheeljack. It's like, oh, am I glad to see you guys? Skyfire is like, all right, you guys get out of here. I'll clean house and catch up with you later, right? And so the Autobots transform and they take off. And then Shockwave says, you cannot get out. <laughs> <laughs> And so Shockwave is shooting at Skyfire. Skyfire dodges. So Shockwave's blast hits the wall, creates a giant hole in the wall. And <laughs> Skyfire goes, well, I can now. And he yeah, just and it leaves takes out off. the hole. So the, the funny thing about the hole, too, is like when Shockwave says, you cannot get out. And it's a beautifully shot scene when he like transforms into gun mode and fires. It's like you don't see him get to do this very often where like... He has turned to a gun that's as big as you. Yeah. You know, that's yeah, scary. He, unlike, say, Soundwave or Megatron, he doesn't mass shift. Yeah. He doesn't shrink down to a gun. He just remains the same size. Yeah. He's like sort of intuiting the combiners to come down the line. He's like, someday, Megatron <laughs> is so awesome. He's going to make six robots who turn to one giant robot, and I'm going to be their gun. <laughs> and we're all just going to sing songs about how cool Megatron is. <laughs> <laughs> But he turns into gun mode and like behind Skyfire is like the hallway that the Autobots escape through. It's like roughly the size of like Trailbreaker or Wheeljack. But there's no way Skyfire can fit through because as we all know, Skyfire is like somewhat bigger than all Autobots, though how much bigger changes episode to episode. (laughs) But there's no way he can walk through. Then when Shaka says you can't get out, he shoots at him. Skyfire just like sidesteps and the wall gets blown out. There's a big hole in the wall, but now the hallway is bigger, too. It's not like there's like a bunch of debris. It's like it's a smooth hallway through the door. So, like, I guess the hallway was always big. It's just the doorway was small. Anyway. I can only imagine the, the construction bill that's piling up after this fight. <laughs> they blew a hole in the wall to get in. They blew a hole in the wall to leave. <laughs> I mean, as we already discussed in the last episode, Shockwave went through a lot of trouble to get this place looking great, talking with uh, Chip and Joanna Gaines. But anyway, <laughs> so <laughs> Skyfire flies away and everybody's shooting after him. And then we cut to outside of Shockwave's headquarters. Yeah, suddenly we cut to like the outside and we see like this nice pan of Cybertron and we're like, oh, this, this is pleasant. What are we going to see now? And we cut to two <laughs> Seekers guarding a door and they're colored like Starscream and Thundercracker. And then suddenly the door explodes from the inside. So <laughs> another quick exit via laser cannon <laughs> explosion and out drive and fly the five Autobots and Spike. So let's take a moment to reflect on how far the Autobots have come in this series. We're on episode 13. You know, episode two, we're not fighters like they are, Prime. <laughs> well, now they got Skyfire and now they're kind of sick of all this business. They've been back to Cybertron a couple times now, you know, to like get different things that they need there. 
They're tired of having to go through Shockwave and his people. So, you know, it's like, well, the last time we were here, it's like, what did they do? They stuck Shockwave to the floor. And I'm like, all right, enough of this. <laughs> enough. Just shoot all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, apparently the doors aren't made of very thick material because they can just <laughs> blow holes through the doors with one shot. And it's like that the Seekers are just like standing there in front of the door like, oh, well, what do you do? It's four o'clock, you know, 20 more minutes till we get off. <laughs> Blam! And they, they fly off of the screen. <laughs> God. Yeah, so suddenly the Autobots, they have to outrace some cannons and turrets on Cybertron and mm -hmm. more Seekers join the chase in their Cybertronic jet modes and they're colored like sky warp mm -hmm. and skyfire manages to take out the seekers but as the other autobots speed away some odd decepticon drone cars sort of speed after them they don't say anything they don't ever transform they just look like little cybertronic cars and they start chasing them yeah there's like weird smooth little future cars with like big domes for windshields they're not domes because the dome makes suggest that it's like rounded it's more like take the very front of like hot rod and then just like cut off the back <laughs> and make it like light, light blue and that's basically what it looks like but luckily the boys are able to duck into wheeljack's lab and they lose the drones now there was no computerized lock this time that they had to come back <laughs> thank goodness <laughs> they cut that scene out of uh, the previous episode of wheeljack like after chip diffused the computerized lock wheeljack ripped it out of the wall and stomped on it for like a good five minutes just cussing it out like ralphie's dad from a christmas story <laughs> that, that for computerized locks so they get inside and bronze like ah oh, need layout wheeljack and Spike's like, oh, I, I bet you can work miracles in here. And, like, <laughs> and I don't really know why Spike would say such a thing, because it's a very Spartan lab. It's not like <laughs> you see like lots of tools and cranes and stuff. No, it's just like walls, the floor, and yet Spike sees it as this great marvel for some reason. Yeah, it's an octagonal room with a bunch of TV screens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, okay, well, I mean, it's it's impressive. It's big. Anyway, but like uh, Wheeljack's like, well, yeah, we're going to need a miracle because I don't know why we're going to fix your dad. And then Bumblebee pulls out a video a video laser disc. Mm -hmm. Remember these? This predates DVDs. He's got the collection of all the Duran Duran videos, and he wants to watch it here <laughs> in Wheeljack's lab. My name is Rio, and she Did you have one of those video disc players when you were a kid? Nope. Never had a laser disc player. Uh, we did. I had the Robert Altman Popeye on video <laughs> disc. We had the first Star Wars movie on laser video disc and Raiders of the Lost Ark. And to this day, I remember exactly the moment when you had to flip the disc on Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> yes, kids, if you are under our age, it may surprise you that you would have to flip a movie in the middle of it to get to the other side of the laser disc, just like old records. <laughs> Literally like old records. And like it came in a big plastic sleeve, which was cool because you got like the, like a big image of the poster arc. So it was about the size of like a, mm -hmm. a It was 12 by 12. It was exactly the same size as a, a record okay. album sleeve. So it was 12 inches by 12 inches. Wow, good memory. Okay, so I didn't want to divert us too long from that, but it's just like as a kid when I saw it, I was like, oh, that's like the thing we have. We have future mm -hmm. technology in our house. Bumblebee's got a laser disc. <laughs> so... He's like, oh, I picked this up at Decepticon headquarters. It's a computer disc with their mind control program. Wheeljack's like, what? He slides it into one of those computer screens in his octagonal room. <laughs> and we see a picture of Sparkplug's head with a glowing thing on his ear. <laughs> Thankfully, all the details that the Autobots could possibly need are just happen to be right here. <laughs> okay, so then Wheeljack says, diabolical. <laughs> and... We get the Autobot symbol flashes on the screen to reveal another Autobot symbol, and we now get to one of the weirdest scenes in Transformers <laughs> history. This is like up there with Carnage and C minor kind of weirdness. But it'll be quite some time away for that one. <laughs> so back on Earth, Optimus Prime, Ratchet, Ironhide, Jazz, and Prowl are showing what surfer dudes they are using jet surfboard things to traverse the rising ocean. They're literally surfing. Their scanners indicate something the size of a mountain behind them, which turns out to be a giant wave. So in the Venn diagram of Transformers fans, 
and surfers. This has got to be your favorite scene. <laughs> yeah, if, if there's there any overlap between those two. So this series is very serious. We've talked about this. And I've tried to celebrate the visual and idea romance whenever it occurs. And this is one of those scenes. But it's just, it's so weird how it comes out of nowhere. It's not explained. Mm -hmm. It's just like, where are the Autobots? They're surfing. Mm -hmm. Okay, but, you know, I mean, in the first episode of Ultimate Doom, like, we at least get Jazz saying, thanks to the crazy water skis, Wheel Jack. I always wanted to play motorboat. And this is just like, nah, we're just surfing. Yeah. Okay, but where do those come from? How do they work? I mean, I don't need everything explained. I've made that case in the past. Right, just give us one sentence, but they don't give us anything. Weird. And like when they see the tidal wave behind them, rather Blue Streak sees it first. He says, surf's up and I'm talking up. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's a great line that like lightens the mood of the series. But yeah, it's just, I don't want to complain about silliness in any episode. But at the same time, this just feels like such an odd thing to have happening here. And it feels like it's one of those things where it's like, shouldn't the masterpiece figures come with surfboards? <laughs> At least the guys who participated in this scene, because like, if you're going to have all those other props and things from specific episodes, this feels like it stands out as such an odd scene that it should be somewhat iconic. I think partly it's not because we don't really get a good look at the surfboards. So <laughs> there's probably no real like design models for the Japanese toy makers to copy. I don't know. And, and then like Optimus says like, oh, okay, well, if we stay ahead of that tidal wave, it could take us where we want to go, right in the Megatron's camp. So Autobots maintain speed and they just keep surfing the wave. So weird. We cut to Dr. Arkerville, who is overseeing the brainwashed humans constructing something for Megatron. And Rumble trips a human just for fun and tells him no lying down on the job. <laughs> Megatron explains. When the tidal wave hits the sea funnel, the fury of the ocean will turn the generators and fill thousands of Energon cubes. Good old Megatron. He always explains his plan to no one in particular. (laughs) You know, my uh, fanfic would be that he secretly likes the fact that Hound or Trailbreaker might be listening all the time. <laughs> and so he's like, he's like, well, you know, it's like, I want to have a legacy. And I know that these guys are recording all everything I say and do. So I'm going to make sure that I control part of the narrative of that legacy when these guys write my biography someday. <laughs> so just so you know, in case anybody's listening, this is what I'm doing right now. <laughs> Well, like I said before, he loves to hear himself talk, and he keeps Starscream he around because Starscream always lures him into an argument. <laughs> That's true. If Starscream wasn't yeah. around, he's like, hey, any Decepticons got any problems with what we're doing? No. <laughs> Anybody want to know my thinking behind my decisions today? No, Megatron. No, we just we love trust you. you. We trust you implicitly. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> So, yeah, he's, where's the other generator? It should be in position by now. Yeah, this job requires two generators and only one is in position. Arkville complains that the funnel structure isn't strong enough and will result in his slaves drowning, but Starscream doesn't have any sympathy for their plight. And Megatron insists that Starscream install the other generator, but Starscream being who he is, he has something to say about the plan. Starscream, install this generator. A waste of time, Megatron! Your plan is unworkable! I said install it! Now! But my slaves will be caught in the tidal wave! I thought humans liked to play in the ocean. You heard my order, Starscream. (laughs) So I think this is a cute little line. Megatron doesn't usually waste any time on jokes. But when he says, I thought humans like to play in the ocean, that's like as humorous as Megatron ever gets. I like it. <laughs> he doesn't smile. You know, like there was that other scene when in the last episode where he's like, uh, remember Megatron, the earth is mine when you're through with it. He's like, oh, it will right. be what's well, left of it. And like right on his face. And he's got that devilish smile. <laughs> but this time he just like looks down and it just feels like that kind of moment. Did you ever visit your cousins when you were a kid at least? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, and you get into like a squabble about something and like you and your 11 year old brain, like justice must be served. You know, he got three <laughs> candies. I got two dad figure this out. And dad would just look down like that and be like, you know, he would say some kind of offhanded comment in that way. This felt like that kind of moment where Megatron's just like, yeah, shut up, Arkaville. I thought humans like to play in the ocean. You heard your order, Starscream, do the thing. 
Another uh, animation note to make here is when Megatron picks up the generator to throw to Starscream, comparatively speaking, if Megatron was a human, he was like lifting like a background pool. Like it was huge. <laughs> and he throws it to Starscream and when it hits Starscream in the chest, it's about the size of a medicine ball. And so it's like <laughs> I did like I froze the screen and looked at the size comparisons. If that if that animation was telling the truth, Megatron would be up to about Starscream's navel. <laughs> it's a weird thing that I noticed when I watched it as a kid and it continued to puzzle me all through my teen years. Like, why did it change size? You know what? <laughs> Different animation teams. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> but it's a weird little bit of incongruity. So Starscream slinks off to install the generator and Megatron warns Archiville to stay away from Starscream, not wanting the two to team up. And this only solidifies the idea in Archiville's head that he should get in league with Starscream rather than Megatron. Because Megatron clearly mm -hmm. does not have Archiville's interest in mind at all. Yeah, it's like, how do you demand loyalty from your soldiers? I don't care about you or the humans that you've enslaved. Right. Oh, by the way, don't do that. Yeah. Don't follow my orders. <laughs> Do not disobey me, Doctor. All right, well, you know, you give me, like, some incentive to disobey you, the enemy of my enemy. Right. Yeah, it's like, whatever you do, don't do this thing. <laughs> You're like, I'm going to do this thing. <laughs> so then we see Megatron hanging out with Rumble, which I always like to see. Yeah. And he asks Rumble if tidal waves are forming. And Rumble's, his visor sort of extends to act as binoculars. <laughs> yeah. Very odd looking. <laughs> yeah. But uh, this allows him to see further away. And the first tidal wave crashes into the turbines of the generators, which produce, quote, energy by the Astro Leader. Astro Leader. As we see Tube sending energy into a Decepticon ship as Megatron celebrates. Okay, so we got to stop here just for a second. If Astro Minutes and Astro <laughs> Seconds are infinitesimally <laughs> small measurements of time, but this suggests that astro measurements of mass are much larger than what we would met. So like a, a liter, we all can imagine what a liter of liquid looks like, but an astro liter must be like a million liters, right? Why would astro measurements of time be infinitesimal, but <laughs> me measurement, astro measurements of mass be so big? I don't and in this it. moment, you have put more thought into it than any of the original <laughs> writers did combined. <laughs> No, they're robots. They measure thing in astro things. <laughs> when you measure mass with astro, it's like Bitcoin. It's like we have three astro liters. Like what? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's impossible to have that much. You can't possibly. Nobody can fit that much on Cybertron. Oh yeah, I can. I got three astro liters. Watch out for me. <laughs> so, yeah, and I, while he's saying that, we're getting like this sort of how it's made video of Energon creation, right? Where there's just like mm -hmm. this pan by of like tubes with energy flying through them and forming cubes, right? But don't count your astro chickens yet because <laughs> that tidal wave is carrying the surfing Autobots directly to Megatron's energy collector. Yeah, Rumble sees them. Yep, Rumble warns Megatron that the Autobots are riding the wave, but Megatron is certain that it spells the Autobots' doom. After all, this is the ultimate doom part three. There better be some dooming pretty soon. <laughs> this is a great line from Optimus where he, like, now they're, like, inside of the energy collector. So there's, these, like, these two sort of metallic arms that go out in a V shape into the ocean to, like, funnel the, the tidal wave's energy in to where the generators are at the vertex of the V. <laughs> anyway, the Autobots are, like, inside of the arms of this thing now as they're surfing along in the water, and Optimus turns back to the Autobots like, hang on, this looks bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like they couldn't convey that it was a bad enough moment, so they had to have Optimus tell us that it was bad. <laughs> Yeah, Megatron says they're riding to their doom, but Optimus says this looks bad. Yeah. So a, a tiny, tiny sliver of old John Wayne Prime. <laughs> Colloquial, a little bit more easygoing, not as fatherly and wise. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, as they're about to get smashed up against the generators, it cuts to commercial, right? Yep. And now we get to learn about the ultimate breakfast, which features... <laughs> Rice Krispies, <laughs> Rice Krispies, Snap, Crackle Pop. Don't forget, part of this nutritious breakfast is, you know, you have Rice Krispies, you have to also have toast, you have to have milk, you have to have orange juice, you have to have... Part of a balanced pancakes, breakfast. Pancakes, you have to have filet mignon and sushi, and like, whenever they showed <laughs> breakfasts in any of these commercials, it was like, here's a 42-course breakfast. 
For a while, we were told by various spooks animals that cereals are part of a complete breakfast. But what exactly is a complete breakfast? As you might guess, it all comes down to <laughs> Like, I do like that they would suggest that that's what the breakfast is, but we as kids do that. No, it's just the bowl of cereal. <laughs> that does not, that reality does not match mine. <laughs> And that orange juice, that ain't orange juice, says Capri Sun. Mom, this is Capri Sun. Yes, it's great tasting fun when you punch open one. There's only one, only one Capri Sun. It's great tasting fun when you punch open one. There's only one, only one Capri Sun. It's great tasting fun when you punch open one. <laughs> so we come back from commercial and we see the Autobots surfing the wave and... Do they jump out? Do they like use Jazz's tow cable? Do they use <laughs> Ironhide's jets? Uh, he had, he did fly in the, in the past. Can they get out of this? Well, no. they just crash through the wall at the end <laughs> of their path, <laughs> and they're unable yeah. to slow their advance. So there's a big crash. Prime asks if everyone's all right, and they're just a little bit beat up from the wipeout. They get up just in time to see the Decepticon ship flying away leaving Prime and his troops to rescue the abandoned human slaves. I do love that it took time to say that. That is a nice touch. You know, Megatron took off, runs away from a fight, and then uh, Ratchet's like, oh, I bet he's got a starship full of Energon cubes. And Prowl's like, well, that much energy at his disposal, I don't see how he can be defeated. You know, so like there's a sense of panic building. Mm -hmm. And then Jazz says, worry later. We got rescuing to do. And we see all these humans like climbing out of the water. <laughs> now Optimus like, let's go help him. And speaking of humans in peril, we cut to yeah. Dr. Arkville hanging from the wreckage of the makeshift hydroelectric plant. Help! Megatron, come back! Megatron is through with you, but I am not. So, in this scene... We've talked a little bit about the music in the first season and how like they do this that, that what they call the Wagner-esque thing where the, there's different themes that play for different characters or different teams like the Autobots have like the noble heroic Autobot music which we all know right it's not the Transformers theme it's a different thing right and in this first season the Decepticons have a theme too which is dun 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 mm -hmm. right and in this scene when Starscream rises out of the ocean the Dr. Arkville's hanging on this like pointy piece of metal that's just like frayed off a building. And then out of the water comes Starscream's hand. He grabs the doctor by the coat, says, Megatron's through with you, but I am not. Transforms and tosses Dr. Arkville to the air and catches him in his cockpit. <laughs> and the Decepticon theme plays again, all in synth. And as far as I can tell, this is the only time they've ever used that. But it sounds so scary mm. when Starscream does this. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it's like all dragged out and it's like kind of like minor key and it's just a synthesizer. Because like whenever they play it before, it's always with some low horns and with a piano. Dun, 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 dun. It has like kind of a march tone to it. But this is like, it's like a creepy one. And... Starscream's kind of creepy in this episode. Yeah, he just like rises up out of the water. <laughs> yeah, and flies away with Dr. Archiville. Well, we cut to the Decepticon shuttle, and who's with Megatron but one reflector robot. <laughs> yeah. And even though he's just one robot here, he's still talking in triplicate. He informs yeah. Megatron that the Energon cubes are secure, and Reflector asks Megatron about his plan for Dr. Archiville, and Megatron says he has no more use for him. Okay, Megatron, you're a bad boss, and I can tell you why when we get to the end of this episode. I'm remembering you said that. Right. I want everybody to remember, I have no further... You fired him. You mm -hmm. fired Dr. Archiville. And he also says, I left Starscream behind to collect energy for the next tidal wave, you know? It's like, did you? Because I didn't see that part where you told Starscream to do right. that. I think you're assuming a little bit, Megatron. <laughs> anyway. I also think it's kind of odd that Reflector's so chatty. Like, yeah. like, what does Reflector care about his plan for Dr. Arkville? <laughs> <laughs> Thunder 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 is not here. here. I, I, I don't know what to talk about to you. you. I, I need, need practice with my interpersonal communication skills. skills. <laughs> Hello, Hello Megatron. Megatron. What is, what is your, your favorite, favorite color? color? <laughs> 
And Megatron is just like wildly tapping like computer keys in front of him to pilot the ship. There's no controls like you would traditionally think of like a, a joystick or a steering <laughs> wheel. It's like it's literally just like a pad of keys that he's like typing on. <laughs> it's like, dang it, I usually have sound wave drive for me. How does this thing work? <laughs> That's totally what it is. And meanwhile, Reflector's talking to him the whole time. <laughs> oh, what happened? This is another important thing is that Megatron keeps leaving his people behind in this episode a lot. <laughs> yeah. So as if last episode was like the best Megatron episode, this is where it's like, boy, he kind of like fell off the beam a few times. <laughs> anyway, so while he flies away, like oh, I'm done with Dr. Arkville, I fired him. I fired him. We go back to Cybertron. And Wheeljack radios Prime and tells him that he's developing a device that should disrupt the hypnochip's control over the humans. We cut to Spike, who's decided he's going to make another go of saving his dad. He's sneaking around trying to get back into the Decepticon Cybertron headquarters. However, he's mm-hmm. discovered by Shockwave and a couple more Seekers. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't blown up all of them, so there's still a couple left. Yeah. So Shockwave picks up Spike as Spike demands to know where his father is. And Sparkplug appears, still under the mind control, and he asks Spike to reveal where the Autobots are as Shockwave casually lets Spike fall to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he orders Sparkplug to destroy the small human. <laughs> yeah. Destroy the small human, big human. I know you're small too <laughs> compared to me, human, but you're bigger than that human. That's the only way I know you people apart. You're all just people with yellow hats to me. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. So this is another animation point that I want to highlight as like, it, there's not a lot of movement, but the framing and the blocking and staging and composition are all so good. When... Spike is being held up by Shockwave. It's like a really close-up of Shockwave's hand holding the back of Spike's shirt. Then it says, where's my father? And you see Sparkplug is like, he, uh, here, join us, be one of us. And then Shockwave sort of like starts playing along. He's like, yes, tell us where your Autobot friends are. Join mm-hmm. us. But while you're looking at that shot, it's shot looking up from behind Sparkplug and Shockwave's in the distance. And we see Sparkplug's arms are behind him because he's concealing something, but we don't even see what he's concealing. Whatever is in his right hand is hidden behind his left arm as his arms are crossed behind him. But it's a really, really cool looking shot that builds a little bit of suspense, and it makes up for the fact that there's not that much movement because it's just so darn nice to look at. It's such a pretty composition. And then, yeah, like when Spike's like, find him yourself, laser breath, and you just see Shockwave's fingers open a little bit, and Spike just falls off camera, and then it (laughs) cuts to Spike on the ground, like holding his back, right? Like you didn't actually see him fall 18 feet onto <laughs> hard metal <laughs> but you got the you got the idea of what happened so destroy the small human well how is spark plug gonna do that <laughs> spark plug pulls a gun but he's interrupted by the arrival of wheeljack's group and wheeljack turns on this device that disrupts the mind control of spark plug as a fight breaks out between the autobots and decepticons and of course spike embraces his dad yeah, this is the part that I love in this episode so much. And I mean, I, I just I just watched it before we started recording today. I was on the treadmill as I watched it. And I got choked up, even <laughs> out of breath, on a treadmill. Wheeljack turns on his caboodle, and the, the you know <laughs> audio disruptor waves go off. And then all of a sudden, Sparkplug's like, what am I doing? And he takes the gun, and he throws it aside. And Spike runs and hugs him. And he says, Dad, everything's all right now. You know, it's like... <laughs> What's great about that line, because the next line is that Trailbreaker would be like, not yet it isn't. <laughs> we're surrounded by Decepticons. A, you know, we're still at enemy headquarters, you know. <laughs> but what's great about that line is what it says to me is like, Spike's so overcome with emotion. Whatever happens next doesn't matter. Even if we die, it doesn't matter because I got my dad back. Any suffering that comes out of this next few moments is worth it because I got my dad back. He's no longer a bad guy. Who knows if they meant it to be that way? Uh, but that's how it tr- it travels to me. And it always chokes me up when I get to that scene. And there's a pretty cool fight scene here. It's, it's, it's not bad. It's not, it's not super imaginative, but it's like exciting. The humans flee as the Autobots lay down some cover fire for them. And everyone starts yep. to escape. <laughs> and Braun says... I'll get the door! As he literally runs through a wall making their exit <laughs> he doesn't like punch a hole through the wall he just runs and a bronze shaped hole is formed <laughs> and, and this is another shot that's really well animated in that the movement isn't super smooth and actually i think it benefits from that because like when he hits the wall the wall just sort of like 
pops. <laughs> it's it's like it's not this graceful, smooth explosion of debris. It's just like he's just running in a straight line away from the camera. And that's another thing I like. Is like there's a lot of shots where we see characters from behind in this one. I think some later episodes where there's cruder animation, I think part of the reason that they suffer or they don't come across as being as well produced is because the staging and the blocking isn't as good. Everything's shot on the horizontal. And when mm. you when you do everything on the horizontal, you really have to sell it and have like really great movement for it to like not be dull. So this shot when Braun runs through the, the wall and makes the hole, mm-hmm. it's again, we're down at Spike's point of view looking up at Braun and he's running away from us to the right to make the hole in the wall. And the, the movement's kind of jerky, but when he hits that wall, it just like pops. So it feels that much more, like there's no recoil on him. It's like when mm-hmm. Cliff Jumper hit him in the chest. He just, he feels like this unstoppable mass just pushing through. He could he could run through a hundred walls because yep. he's brawn. <laughs> also, I like the politeness. I'll get the door. <laughs> 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 it's a great scene. And he, yeah, he's, he's terrific in this one. So the Autobots signal Skyfire to come pick him up because, you know, Skyfire is just, he goes where he's told to go. You know, ever yeah. since Wheeljack broke him out of the ice, he's just... He's essentially their Uber. (laughs) So the Autobots all load into Skyfire, and they're all safe for the time being. Sparkplug is thanking everyone for the rescue. Thanks, guys, for not giving up on me. Especially you, Spike. Dad, it's like you taught me. You never quit on the people you love. Mushy, but true. And now we're going to have to say goodbye to Jersey because he's in such tears that he can't continue on this episode. <laughs> it's a great scene. It's a great scene. And I love that Bumblebee's like sitting in the seat in front of them and he's just smiling. He's <laughs> <laughs> like, I like it when my friends are happy. <laughs> and yeah, and even Braun agrees that this is this is <laughs> what it's all about, right? Yeah, oh. this, is, this is probably the best Braun episode. If not the yeah. best, it's it's probably top three for sure. Well, I mean, he gets a lot of time in microbots, but he's a mm-hmm. jerk in that one. In this one, he's a really good, well-rounded hero. He's like Raphael from the Mutant Ninja Turtles, except not angsty. <laughs> How could you not like Braun? And he's only three ninety nine at your local store. <laughs> Tell your parents, kids tfsource.com and so on and so forth big bad toy store and so on and so forth advertise on our show people okay so (laughs) what in the hell kind of sales approach is that you boys couldn't sell a dollar for 50 cents as we see them flying towards earth we get closer to earth and we're at a different location and cool place for the final conflict to happen, it's like a tropical island, right? Yep, and we see the same Decepticon shuttle from before. And here, Megatron is overseeing the loading of the shuttle with Energon cubes. We see a bunch of brainwashed humans <laughs> carrying Energon cubes into the shuttle. Uh-huh. And we pull back to see the Autobots spying on them. Hidden in the brush, behind mm-hmm. the trees and behind a bunch of foliage. Yep. And this is Prime's little subgroup of Autobots that we were following earlier. And we see Cliff Jumper remark that he wants to blast Megatron's smile off his faceplate. But Optimus <laughs> retorts that it would endanger the humans, especially knowing Cliff Jumper's aim. <laughs> that was my first thought when I rewatched the episode. I'm like, yeah, who is going to make a crack about how, <laughs> like, actually, every other Autobot there could probably take out the Decepticons without hurting the humans. But, like, when Cliff Jumper suggested, like, no, not you, anybody but you. <laughs> <laughs> So Mirage is there, and Mirage volunteers to see if he can direct Megatron away from the ship, because Mirage has invisibility powers. And that shuttle would be a good ride home. (laughs) Home. (laughs) But nearby, Starscream's trying to drain energy from Arkaville's mind, but has failed to fill a single Energon cube. Let's stop there for a second. First of all, (laughs) why did Starscream go to the same island that Megatron is? (laughs) Secondly, he said, Megatron's through with you, but I am not. What's your plan, Starscream? I'm going to get Energon cubes from his brain. What? (laughs) 
Starscream, you were a scientist <laughs> on Cybertron. <laughs> I mean, and I know the human brain produces electricity, but I don't think it's anywhere near what you... If you have to, like, stop generators with the null ray in order to make energon cubes... Like, did he hit Dr. Archiville with his null ray before he <laughs> hooked him up to this machine? And Archiville is sitting on a rock with his hands tied behind his back, and he's got, like, this gigantic yoke-style collar around yeah. his neck, which is wired to a little box that has like a wireless charging station sticking out of the top of it. <laughs> and Starscream's, he, again, Starscream, you telegraphing your punches because what does he do? What is he saying to the doctor while he's trying to get energy from his brain? Without my own energon source, I shall never be able to take control of the Decepticons. That's mutiny, Starscream. Megatron. And the penalty for mutiny. <laughs> wow yeah talk about telegraphing yeah. my own energon source i shall never be able to take control of the decepticons i guess he's learning from the best like like what would megatron do in the situation well he would say his plan loudly <laughs> to whoever's listening in case somebody is listening in it just so happens that megatron is listening also again really nice shots here. Starscream turns and looks over his shoulder when Megatron mm -hmm. says that's mutiny. It's a really great composition. I, I advise people to watch this scene carefully because it's really, really well set up. It makes zero sense why Starscream is there with Dr. Archiville. Also, let's back up two steps because Megatron's like, I want the slaves to put cubes in the ship faster. <laughs> Where is Dr. Archiville? Right. We have all worked with somebody like this in the past. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> you're off the project oh i'm sending you home early and then two hours later like hey how come they're not doing the thing i told them to you didn't tell them to do that thing you, you told them to go home you fired them <laughs> what no i didn't i mean when i was 19 and i worked in retail i literally had an argument with with a, a manager like this where i wasn't like aggressively fighting back i was like but you didn't say mm -hmm. you i mean you never told me and they're like yes i did and they're like getting angrier and angrier. I'm like, no, but I have no memory of this. Like this scene, like makes it feel like it feels like that to me. Where Megatron's like, dude, like mm -hmm. eight minutes ago, you said I have no further use for him. And then the moment the slaves don't match your expectation, where is Doctor Archiville? <laughs> and I just imagine like Rumble and Skywarp looking at each other, going like, oh boy, <laughs> who's who's gonna tell him? I'm not gonna tell him. Are you gonna tell him? I'm not telling him. <laughs> But thankfully for everybody, Starscream was like, well, I got to go find a place where I could suck the energy out of your brain. How about I go to that place where Megatron is? <laughs> <laughs> so Megatron's going to kill Starscream. He did say, you have had the only warning I intend to give in episode one of the miniseries. Yeah. So now he's delivering on that warning. Yep. And the penalty for mutiny is termination. And this is the first ever fade to black for a second commercial break where it's a villain in peril. <laughs> so I guess the, wow. the kids are like, oh, no, Starscream's not going to die, is he? Isn't that what Young Hoover was thinking? <laughs> well, yeah, but. <laughs> <laughs> so Hoover's watching this and then suddenly he's like, look, I know Thunder Punch E-Man has master power, pa 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 power. Call it master power. Da -da 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 -da. Some guys got it, some guys don't. Thunder Punch E-Man's that kind of guy with a blast in his shoulders and fists that fly. Thunder Punch E-Man throws a punch through the air. You hear it here, but you feel it there. <laughs> but I, I don't care because Starscream is in mortal peril and because Megatron gave him one warning and it's like, look, Okay, TV, I asked my parents, but they just won't buy me G.I. Joe Underoos, so quit trying to sell them to me. I want to know what happens to Starscream. Now there's something just for you and pretty E from Underoos. Underwear. E.T. is lots of fun. In my world, he's number one. G.I. Joe marching ahead. One of my friends is young and pray. And then maybe nothing can stop the animal, but that's not important to me right now. I want to find out what happened to Starscream. Can anything stop the animal? The animal. It's a big, powerful four by four. But when the going gets tough, it bears its claws. And we come back from commercial break, and Megatron is saying, <laughs> "Again, these guys, these Decepticons, are so bad at this. They just they have to stop and talk instead of doing something. He's like, say farewell, traitor, giving <laughs> Starscream enough time, because then suddenly Skywarp says something, right?" Yeah, Skywarp interrupts, and he says he's got an emergency, and this intrigues Megatron, who turns around, 
And so Starscream uses the moment to flee with Dr. Arkerville, and Megatron goes back to see what the hubbub is about, and Skywarp explains that the humans are malfunctioning, carrying Energon <laughs> out of the ship. And then suddenly yeah. Mirage turns visible and remarks that it seems like Megatron has run out of friends. <laughs> I don't even know what that line means. Again, Mirage is staying on, on brand with, like, opaque jokes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the ship was full. It looks like you've run out of friends. But I've got all my guys right here. <laughs> <laughs> and so Optimus uses the distraction while Megatron's trying to figure out Mirage's joke. And so... <laughs> Or maybe that was the plan all along. Maybe that was one of Prowl's military strategies. Where he's like, Mirage, you go and say something really obtuse that Megatron has to think about. And then while he's thinking, we'll attack. Oh, I see. I see. It's like it's like that episode of Star Trek when Captain Kirk destroys that robot by saying, everything I say is a lie. Right. Now listen carefully. I am lying. <laughs> yes. It's like, but in my fanfic, it's Mirage doesn't know. That's what Prowl is telling him to do. Prowl is just like, Mirage, go up there, turn invisible, and turn around. When they see you, tell a joke. Why would that stop them? Just do it. Just do it. And then like everybody else is like, why would you have him do that? Have you heard Mirage's jokes? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was like well now that your slaves are out of the way we can attack and Megatron says a fool's ploy prime look above you it's like okay it's he got some secret thing no it's just the jets <laughs> <laughs> and Thundercracker and Skywarp attack Yeah, but soon it turns into the typical Autobots and Decepticons using rocks and things for cover as they shoot one another where they're just like yeah. a bunch of guys on one side shooting a bunch of guys on the other side shooting and they're just using giant boulders and stuff to hide behind as they do it. There's still a lot of really nice looking shots here. Like, again, I keep thinking about like low frame rate or jerky animation can always be saved by a really cool looking angle. And there's some really nice shots of, of Thundercracker flying towards the Autobots, like shooting his missiles. And it's just like it's got like a really cool force perspective and like dynamism. And so it doesn't it's still the, the battle scene, though, it's not very imaginative. And it's not like super awesomely animated. It still looks really good. Mm. Yeah, I agree. And so Prowl, military strategist, suggests a retreat. And what I like about this episode is the few times that Prowl says something, it does sound like yeah. military strategy. So it's yeah. like they paid attention to him fulfilling that role in the team. Yeah, he says, I, I suggest a strategic retreat for mm -hmm. regrouping. Yep. You know, which is when we were kids, it's like, well, that sounds like military talk. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that checks out. <laughs> but Prime says they don't have the luxury for a retreat because Cybertron is getting closer and closer. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, Skyfire and his team soon arrive to even the odds here. Mm -hmm. And Wheeljack. Oh, yeah. Wheeljack leans out the window or like, like the cargo door is open on Skyfire and he leans out with his caboodle and says, it's Independence Day. And then he turns on the thing and all the humans, the, the remaining humans, like their hypnochips deactivate. And for the first time, we see humans that are not dressed like Spike and Sparkplug. Right? <laughs> like the, this is like a dude in a T-shirt and like glasses and some other like regular casual people <laughs> drop their energy cubes and run away. And Megatron gets ticked. He's like, oh, you're going to pay for that. And he turns into gun mode and doesn't fall into a Decepticon's hand. He just like hovers in the air and fires at Skyfire. <laughs> Skyfire proclaims, leave Megatron for me. And I like yeah. that idea. I like this sort of almost like a callback to Fire in the Sky where there's, mm -hmm. there's this sort of like rivalry between Skyfire and Megatron where skyfire feels like he was duped by megatron and he, he needs mm. payback here yeah but unfortunately we don't get an epic skyfire megatron battle by any means no there's not much time left in the episode so but we get the sense that yeah and i i remember picking up on that as a kid too because i have a very clear memory of that line and thinking of that episode where he clumsily picks up megatron and throws him into a nice thing so then we go, cut into the jungle, and now we're getting, following this what was sort of set out with the original three-parter, it's like, let's go back to some of the previous drama from this series and sort of turn it around for our hero, right? Like, mm -hmm. I owe you one from Sherman Dam, Rumble! But now it rumbles in the jungle, sneaking up on Bumblebee, turns on the pile drivers, opens up a crevice, and Bumblebee says, Not again! Because we're remembering that that earthquake in episode one of this three-parter, he mm -hmm. falls into that crevasse. Yeah. 
And so he totally does like a Tarzan move and grabs onto a vine and swings around. Yeah, somehow the vine is strong enough to support a Volkswagen Beetle and Bumblebee just kicks a rumble into their crevasse that he just made. So now Prime squares off against Megatron, but Megatron points out that the impending tidal wave has arrived or is about to splash down, and that's a much more immediate threat, and he manages to escape as Prime shifts his focus to that yep so megatron i mean this is like a classic thing in these old cartoons that the bad guys always have the built-in advantage that the good guys have their procedure or their ethos or their directives directives that's the word i'm looking for is protect the innocent is is of a higher order Mm -hmm. than stopping the villain and the yeah. villain always gets to play that card. And I love that I love that mechanism because Optimus is like, well, hey, this tidal wave's your problem too. Megatron's like, no, it's not, because right. I won't be here. <laughs> <laughs> he laughs as he runs up the gangplank to his ship and he takes off without any of his dudes. He's like, see you guys, I'm going back to Cybertron with enough energy to rule forever. I guess I don't need any Decepticons anymore. <laughs> well, they can fly. <laughs> <laughs> and plus Cybertron's just like right up there anyway and they can they can just fly right there. So yeah, we go onto the beach and we see like Thundercracker's wrestling with Wheeljack and Sky Orp is wrestling with Ironhide or somebody. And again, it's there's not a lot of movement. It's a good looking shot. It's cool to see Autobots and Decepticons grappling on a beach as water lashes up on the on the shore kind of thing. It's it's cool looking. And then Skywarp looks up. He's like, oh, Megatron's leaving without us. <laughs> and then it cuts to where does the next shot? The next shot is it goes to the feet of Thundercracker and Wheeljack wrestling. And we just see Thundercracker's heels. And he says, well, we're going too." And you see his jets fire and he f- slowly rises up and then like transforms into jet mode right in front of Wheeljack's face and then flies off. <laughs> so it's just it, again, it's just like all you have to do is just think about what's an interesting thing to see. Mm-hmm. And you can get around clumsy animation. Yep. Very true. So Prime fears that the tidal wave is going to destroy human life across the globe. But (laughs) Spike deduces that they just need to knock Cybertron out of Earth's orbit. Oh, that's all they need to do. (laughs) And he's going to do it with Prime's gun. (laughs) It's a pretty big gun. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, like when Optimus is expressing his dismay, this is another nice shot. We like pan across the beach and we see all the Autobots looking at this tidal wave with horror. And it zooms in on Spike, who's standing next to Optimus's feet. And then Optimus's gun drops and falls next to Spike. It doesn't bounce. There's no recoil. It just, like, drops. Boom! Just flat, right? That's how heavy this big gun is. And then it pans up to Optimus looking horrified. And he says, that tidal wave will destroy human life across the face of the globe. And, again, it's like nothing really moved that much in that shot. The the gun falls to the ground, but, like, it did, you know, it's like you just move it across the, 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 the screen and, like, a little bit of dust kicking up. But it feels really scary, right? It's not is it's not like him reaching to the camera going Megatron like he did in the first miniseries, but it's the same kind of horror, and it's done I think very elegantly with with minimal movement. It's just with camera pans, and it's just with like staging the shot. So when Spike's like, "Yeah, we just got to knock Cybertron out of Earth's orbit," he like sort of like uses his whole body to lever up Optimus's gun onto the sand so he can fire it, and Prowl's like, "Well, it can't be done." Like how how much how much do you need to to, to move Cybertron? Prowl says energy? that they need the equivalent of ten billion astroliters of energy to do that. Wow, that's the astroliters of the sun that you got to <laughs> generate to do that. But Prime quickly realizes that that's the amount of energy on board Megatron's shuttle. <laughs> so if they blow it up, yep, it could do it. What I like about this scene too is if you watch it carefully. Prowl's like, that's impossible. It would take 10 billion astroliters of energy. And then Spike fires anyway. And then Prowl turns away from Spike and starts shooting too. Now, Prowl's a military strategist. We've established that because he uses those fancy words like the military <laughs> people do. He doesn't say anything. But it feels like in that moment, he understands Spike's plan. And then Optimus understands Spike's plan. Mm. So Prowl got it first, right? Why else would he shoot? And then Prime says, the Energon cubes on Megatron's starship. And then it just, uh, the next shot is all the Autobots firing on Megatron's <laughs> ship. And inside the shuttle, Megatron shouts, no, no, as the shuttle is seemingly atomized in the explosion. <laughs> we see it blow up and then we don't see any debris. That's true. Well, just before it blows up, we see the cargo hold. And we see all the Energon cubes getting buffeted around. And then mm-hmm. suddenly they all start exploding in a chain reaction. 
And then <laughs> this explosion happens and like all the air is being whipped up and we get like a replay of some of the devastation shots from episode one yeah. of the miniseries. And this goes on for like a good, like, I want to say like 10, 15 seconds of just showing like tornadoes and mm-hmm. dust. And we see like wind and water. Optimus looking at the sky, looking horrified. And finally, Spike says, it's working. <laughs> <laughs> we hear him narrating. He says, Cybertron is moving out of its orbit. Mm-hmm. And it's just like zooming away from the Earth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <sighs> yeah. So Cybertron <laughs> zooms out of sight. Cut to the tidal wave. And it just starts to lose energy and just slowly settles down and levels out. Yep. And Bumblebee's like, ah, shucks, I wanted to go surfing. And Bronze's like, ah, me too, me too. And there's, it's not a great line, but then it cuts to Optimus. Another, another shot with no, like very minimal movement, but we pan up his body. We look at him and he's looking at the sky and we see three seagulls like flying around just gently in the distance, which is like, <sighs> This whole idea about clarity, right? Instead of Optimus saying, like, everybody's safe, let's just show it. Let's just show, Mm -hmm. like, three birds flying and Optimus looking up at them to show that he's satisfied that their job is done and the Earth has been saved. And in in a nice, quiet way, you know? Instead of, like, at the end of Divide and Conquer, where after he sends Megatron home, he goes to the top of a hill and holds both arms up in the air and all the Autobots (laughs) start cheering. (laughs) It's like, it's like, what are you playing football? Or are you trying to stop a war? It's like here, he, it's just like a quiet moment. Like, okay, we did it. We did it. Oh, thank goodness. So, so Spike's celebrating the victory, but Worry Wart Optimus is sure that Megatron has not been defeated. So we yeah. cut to outer space where we finally see some wreckage of the Decepticon shuttle. We see Megatron just floating there, and then his eyes light up, and he declares that he will be avenged. And then we see him fly off into the darkness of space. Just like at the end of the first miniseries, it's almost the same movement, right? Mm-hmm. Like he just, he's floating there. He apparently, he looks like he's dead. And then he flies not toward you. Not like I will be avenged. Ah, jump at you. You know, the end of the end of the Masters of the Universe movie where Skeletor's head pops up says, I'll be back. Spoilers. <laughs> um, but, but like he flies away and up. He flies off to the right. And then at the very last moment, he zoops up into the, to the top of the screen. Another great ending. I think it's a nice parallel. I'm not sure. I mean, somebody could say, well, they just ripped off the ending of the first three-parter. And and I guess I choose to believe that it's just meant as a story parallel. Yeah, as a story symmetry. Yeah. Yeah, rather than than ripping off an easy ending that we've already done. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, at this point, so here's the other thing to consider. It's like we made a lot of hay out of in the first miniseries that like we didn't know whether or not we were getting any more of this. So the stakes felt very real when we were watching it for the first time. At this point, we know that we're getting more of this, right? We're not even done with the first season. It's yeah. it's it's in the TV guide. TV guide <laughs> was this book that was distributed at grocery stores. It told you what TV shows were going to be on because we didn't have the internet yet. It's not a big deal. But it sometimes had cool covers like Welcome Back Cotter might be on the cover. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Joni Loves Chachi is on the cover. That's great. <laughs> You know, we knew that it was coming back. So now it becomes sort of like, it's like, Again, I think about like the way kids' minds work and the way kids play and like and like how rhyming and repetition are part of a child's life at that point. That's like inculcation is how you learn. And also it's the way kids play on the playground. Like when you watch Power Rangers and all of the characters are announcing what they're doing while they're doing it and they're doing all of this like choreography that's like a dance that they're doing as they're getting ready to do their thing. I'm getting ready to use my gun as I swing my arms around this way, right? <laughs> and I think like, that's what kids do in the playground because they have to telegraph what they're doing because you can't see in their head what they're imagining. So you have to talk it through, right? And anybody who's played Dungeons and Dragons or any kind of role playing system, you have to talk through what you're doing. And so like, it's like those things when it happens in a show, people are like, well, that's so weird. I'm like, well, but it's not weird when you think about like how children play. Right. Mm-hmm. And so like having that symmetry and that repetition, I, I don't feel like is uncreative. I feel like it's, thoughtfully sort of writing toward how an 11 year old's mind works Mm. so i don't know that's the excuse if you want to call it that a rationalization that i'm always going to go to because i i feel like there's a lot of utility to that description 
And I work with that age group a lot. And I could tell you that they, it's not until they get to 13 that they start calling that stuff out. Like <laughs> 11 and 12, they're, they're all in on it. 13 is when they're like, well, that's dumb. They just did the same thing twice. I'm like, okay, you're smarter now. You're noticing things. Good for you. <laughs> so anyway, but I like it. I like that symmetry. I like that book ending of two miniseries that sort of, they play with the same kind of pacing and routine and rhythms, but they do it in different ways. Like you pointed out, we had a, we had a, a commercial act break where the villain is jeopardized, mm-hmm. right? It feels like the tension between Megatron and Starscream is more real in this one than in the first one. Yeah. In the first one, he shoots Starscream in the arm and Starscream's like, oh, Megatron, Megatron. And it's like, there's no consequence. You know, in this, Megatron never shoots him. He chokes him. He swats him on the ground once, but he never shoots him. So, like, when he's getting ready to, it's like, okay, here it comes, you know? And I don't feel like it ended with the first two miniseries don't have decisive wins for Megatron the way the first miniseries did. Like, you correctly pointed out that, like, even the Decepticon base is getting kind of bashed up by all this nonsense. Mm -hmm. So... I don't know. I think it's pretty good. I think this is a great miniseries. It's got a few clunky spots as far as animation goes. It's got some odd little bits of storytelling weirdness, like Starscream going to Megatron's Island, <laughs> Dr. Archiville. But yeah, this one will always be a favorite of mine. Yeah, it was a very good story, and it was definitely good as a three-parter. <laughs> well, I say three-parter, but yeah. next episode is going to feel like the Ultimate Doom Part 3 and a half, where... <laughs> Where we take all the hanging plot threads and put a little bit of a better bow onto them. <laughs> right, right, because we got a couple. Let's see, hanging plot threads. Okay, Cybertron got kicked out of Earth's orbit. That's good, but it's not floating around in our solar system. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? You know, like, is it going to join our planetary system? Is it just going to keep on flying away? Well, it took Voyager how many years to exit our solar system? You know, like 30 something odd years. So, you know, are we going to be at the point where Transformers the movie is happening by the time Cybertron is out by Pluto, you know? (laughs) And then Starscream said, I shall return as he flew away with Dr. Archiville. Well, what's that all about? What's going on there? Right. So we got at least those two major ideas that have to be addressed soon. Hopefully the next episode does touch on some of that stuff, doesn't it? Yep. Thankfully, so. it's it's almost like they were like, wait a minute, <laughs> we can't just <laughs> go to a new show because there's all these dangling things. Let's get those out of the way first. You there, write oh, me an episode. Let's not forget that Cybertron was in Earth orbit for three episodes, ripping the planet apart. Mm-hmm. Surely there are some consequences right. <laughs> that that need to be explored. You and know. maybe that wouldn't be addressed in a show like Super Friends, but mm-hmm. clearly they felt it needed to be addressed here. Yeah. So, all right. Well, we got an intense one to look forward to, right? Yep. And just as a special little preview, somebody yeah. makes his first appearance next episode. Oh, somebody makes the first appearance. Yep. I'm not going to mention who. I don't know who you're talking about. You I'm will. excited. I will. So don't unsubscribe. You know, at least <laughs> we gotta like start injecting a lot of cheap ways to get people to listen to the next episode. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there is yeah. actually a first appearance of someone next episode, but I think we'll start injecting some cheap reasons for you guys to stick around. <laughs> okay, we need to start doing cliffhangers <laughs> with us. Like, oh, you need to start choking on a piece of candy before the episode ends. And (laughs) I say, does Jersey survive? Tune in next episode. (laughs) (laughs) Will that woman ever find the beef? Find out next time. (laughs) Where's the beef? Some hamburger places give you a lot less beef on a lot of bun. Where's the beef? At Wendy's, we serve a hamburger we modestly call a single. And Wendy's single has more beef than the Whopper or Big Mac. At Wendy's, you get more beef and less bun. All right. Well, thank you, Hoover. This was a good one. I'm glad we're doing this thing. This is fun to check in and, and scrutinize and celebrate this TV show we both love so much. Yeah, it it really does feel very different. I mean, even though I've watched these shows a ton over the years... I'm watching them with different eyes now. 
And so Mm -hmm. I noticed things I never, ever noticed before. And I'm getting a better, not memory, but I'm paying closer attention, I guess you could say, to things. And it uh, feels like a college course where I'm studying Transformers. Before, I enjoyed Transformers, but now I'm studying Transformers. It's a little Mm -hmm. bit subtly different. Yeah. Yeah, it does change the way that it, it feels to watch it, right? You're watching it with, with you know, more than just two eyes open. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening. You know, social media stuff is going to be mentioned in a second here, ways to contact us. And the show is released on Thursdays at 4millionyearslater.com and wherever you get podcasts. So until next time, I have been Jersey Drozd of 4millionyearslater.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I have been the ultimate hoove, but next time I will just be regular hoove. <laughs> okay, bye. Bye-bye. Episode synopses are from imdb.com and some episode information taken from tfwiki.net. The closing theme is by Nick Mahalik, based on the original closing theme by Ford Kinder and Ann Bryant. You can find more of Nick's music at soundcloud.com slash nicholas-mahalik. That's spelled... N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S dash M-E-H-A-L-I-C-K Find us on Facebook under 4 Million Years Later and you can email us at 4 Million Years Later at gmail.com Visit 4 Million Years Later dot com and if you haven't yet please subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts you know how it works <laughs>